Oh, hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 62 of Circle of Fellows. I am Shell Holtz. I am Director of Internal Communications at Webcore, which is a commercial general contractor uh, here in the uh, Bay Area and throughout California. Uh, I am joined by four of my fellow fellows, uh, and I'll have them introduce themselves in just a minute. Uh, but first, I want to introduce the topic and uh, go over just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, the topic is communicating safety, which is something that people uh, in communications departments in all kinds of organizations have to do. And I think one of the challenges there is that for a lot of people, it's uninteresting and it's ticking off a compliance box without being terribly creative about it or looking for measurable results. And I think that tends to mirror uh, the attitude about safety that we see throughout many organizations. Uh, working for a construction company, we, we take a different view, and we'll get into that during the course of the discussion. Uh, we invite you to ask questions in real time uh, as we are uh, discussing this topic, and you can do that two ways. One is if you're watching live on YouTube, uh, there is a chat feature in YouTube Live, and just feel free to throw a question there. I can see them right here. Uh, I can even project them up onto the screen so everybody can see them. So please ask your questions, share your comments, uh, your observations and experiences. Um, the other way, if you are somehow watching this through some other means or unable to use the chat feature uh, in YouTube, uh, by all means, uh, send a tweet. Just be sure to use the hashtag COF62. That's for Circle of Fellows, episode 62. We're so clever with our hashtags. Uh, and I have uh, that up on the screen monitoring that too, and I can uh, get your questions to the panel. With that, uh, let's have the panel introduce themselves, starting with Angela. Hi, I'm Angela. Uh, the reason I think I'm on this conversation is that during my corporate years, we I worked for a lot of companies that had a lot of uh, potential safety issues. I worked at the Chicago Tribune with all the printing presses, the, the distribution trucks. And then I was working as vice president of communication at a company that had four life and death businesses, an ambulance company, a home security company, and some nursing related companies. Um, so I've certainly experienced doing the communication on the corporate side, but more recently in the last 20 years, I've had my own consulting firm where I do research and measurement. And we've had several very interesting studies related to how, how much impact communication had on improving safety. Great. Uh, just moving uh, clockwise from Angela, uh, we've got Neil. Hi, everybody. Neil Griffiths coming to you from the UK um, from a from a spare room because the kids are coming home in a minute. So if we get some little intruders, I do apologize. Um, and I guess, yeah, like like Angela, I mean, I've been working in organizations that safety is a, a central um, feature of our value system, actually. Um, so I've worked in major engineering companies and now in sustainability consulting where we've got uh, people going out in the field um, on various assignments. So safety is as a core principle for, for two organizations over the past 10 years and been involved in, in different um, in different ways in that. Um, and I, I must shout out to my colleagues who do far more in the, the, sustain, the um, safety communication space than I do currently at ERM. Um, but yeah, happy to bring the experience from, from the past 10 years to, to this session. Thanks, Neil. And moving on to Alice. Hi, I'm Alice Brink. I'm a communications consultant in Houston. And being in Houston, a lot of my uh, practice and corporate experience has focused on at the energy industry. And of course, safety is a huge, huge priority for people in drilling roles and other uh, refinery roles and all of those areas. And one of my very first communication roles was in a manufacturing plant and a safety campaign was the big thing that we did the first year I was there. So it's my one of my very first communication challenges. And I've always been the safety guy's favorite communicator ever since. <laughs> and uh, finally, Martha. Hi, I'm Martha Mazetchka and I'm based in Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. And uh, I've worked in safety in a number of different ways. My first introduction really was around uh, public health and looking at health promotion. And uh, where if you had an issue, we created a brochure and all was great. 
but I've done a lot of work with mining and energy companies as well since then, and particularly also looking at mental health and substance use. And one of the things that uh, I've learned is that safety is not something just energy or mining should be concerned about, but that safety is something that all organizations need to be aware of uh, because there's just so many things that can happen. Um, and it's not that you're going to live your life under a cloud, but you need to be aware and prevent uh, and how you communicate that effectively is something that uh, I think we're going to be talking about today in some detail. Right. So when we talk about safety, uh, one of the things that I take very seriously is the notion that an organization that is, is serious about safety is one where employees uh, are able to bring their, their whole selves to work because they're not worried about whether they're going to get home. Uh, at night. They understand that safety is a priority in the organization. I, I want to lead off uh, with a tale uh, of a CEO, uh, Paul O'Neill, uh, who had previously been uh, Secretary of the Treasury uh, in the United States federal government, uh, accepted the job of CEO at Alcoa. Uh, and he took a little bit of time to see what was going on in this organization that had uh, profit issues. Uh, is why he had been brought in. Uh, and he got up at a shareholders meeting and said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for bringing me on board. Uh, I am going to focus on one thing and one thing only for uh, the first part uh, of my tenure, and that is safety. Um, people ran out of the room and got on the phone and said, you got to sell this stock. <laughs> He's not focusing on profitability. Uh, but what he did was uh, he talked about safety first in every meeting that he went to. Uh, he told people that if there was an accident in any of their facilities anywhere in the world, he wanted to know about it within 24 hours personally. Uh, and then he involved people in the discussion about how to improve safety. Uh, when there was a, a, an accident that took an employee's life, he saw to it that the manager was fired because he had violated safety protocols. Uh, and over a period of time, employees in this organization said, hey, he really cares about us. Uh, and what you saw was a turnaround in their, in their profitability, in their operational effectiveness, because people repaid that concern uh, with harder and smarter work. Um, now, obviously, he was communicating something. Had nothing to do with articles on the internet or posters on a job site. Right, but but sending a very clear message. Uh, he did that on his own as a CEO. But how important is it to get the leaders of the organization to make safety a genuine priority if you're going to get employees to take it seriously? Yeah, I, th I think it's critical. I remember I was working with a mining company, and we were one of the things we were talking about was safety. And employees are saying, yeah, we know how we're supposed to work safely, but what am I supposed to do when my supervisor tells me to go into a part of the mine that is not safe in, in the wrong way? Do, do I lose my job or do I lose my life? So that leadership, making sure that supervisors are following it and doing the right thing is critical. That's yeah. why I like the idea of firing the ones when there is an accident. That, that, that works. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the whole concept of giving people stop work authority is empowering people to stand up for the safety of the workplace for themselves and for each other. And a lot of companies uh, talk that, but don't live it. I was with a company that really wanted to make the point that this was real. And so we found a story of somebody who had stood up to a, 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 a you know, this was a drilling company. And so the customer was on site on the rig and this uh, employee stood up to the customer and said, we're not going to do this. It's not safe. And the customer filed a complaint with the higher management and the higher management backed up the employee. There's another example I have. I was doing a survey for a trucking company once. And one of the things we were just looking at is how many people have access to different types of meetings and how useful the meetings are. And I remember presenting to the leadership team that uh, safety meetings, something like 25% of employees said they did not have access to safety meetings, maybe 15%. And they said, okay, all of your research is bogus. That can't be possibly true. And I said, how do you know that? They said, well, every month we get signed 
uh, meeting sheets that show who came to the meetings every month for the safety meeting. And we get close to 100% every time. And I said, very interesting, because when I looked at the breakouts, there were some locations that had 100% attendance and people saying they had access to the meetings. And there were others that 0% said they had safety meetings. So basically, they discovered the supervisors were falsifying these sign-in sheets because they weren't rewarded on safety. They were rewarded for filling the trucks quickly and as fully as possible. And they thought the safety meetings were taking away from that time for what they got paid to do. And, I did some work a few ahead, years Martha. ago. Uh, and uh, when I went to this meeting with the client, one of the things that we started off with was the safety moment. Every meeting was an opportunity to talk about safety in a small way. And the culture in this company was that safety was their number one goal. And we were encouraged um, to see how safety played in all parts of our lives. It wasn't just a workplace issue, it was also a home issue. So we looked at opportunities to share information that was relatable to people and transferable, not just in the workplace, but also home. And then issues that we encountered perhaps at home that might be applicable um, in the workplace. And so to me, an integral part of successful safety communications is how well are you fostering and developing and supporting a total safety culture in your company. So that the concept here is you've got my back and I've got yours because we're watching out for each other. We're making sure that at the end of the day, we all get to go home to our families. And I think that's really critical because when we look at also issues around psychological safety and bringing your whole self to work, when we look at diversity issues, understanding if you don't call out and be supported in challenging unsafe practices, how safe will you be if you challenge um, a comment that is derisive or discriminatory? And then if you're working in a place that truly does have significant dangers, such as a drill rig, how comfortable will you be that everyone has your back if at the same time they're not being safe in a psychological way in terms of treating you as a person who's worthy of respect. So for me, the safety culture has to be looked at and it has to be comprehensive and as broad as possible to look at the whole self, not just the significant danger that a particular environment can present. I was, <clears throat> I was gonna comment before, it actually builds on, on what Martha's saying there, that I think a lot of this comes down to behaviors and, and actions versus words. Um, and it will be in the, the demonstration of, of an organization's commitment to safety that that will, that will play out. Um, you know, it's gonna be very obvious very quickly whether we're a, a, compli a compliance-based organization or we actually really mean what we say um, and, and go beyond doing the bare minimum. So, you know, back to your question, Shell, I mean, it's, it's absolutely essential that the leaders act um, and the leaders get behind the the overall safety program, integrate that into a value system, and then enable people to 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 enact that uh, across the organization at all levels. So uh, well before I started at WebCore, apparently they had uh, some safety incidents that led the leadership to say, this is unacceptable. Uh, they took it on as uh, a challenge and an initiative. Uh, our safety record is outstanding these days. Uh, and you know, one of the things that I get in the mail, email, I, this is absolutely nothing to do with internal communications. This is strictly out of the safety function. Uh, there's a, a, a utility called Safety Stratus that they use. And every time there's an incident, they have to enter it uh, into Safety Stratus. Uh, it gets rated, you know, as a, a high, medium, or low uh, rating uh, on the severity of the incident. Uh, they also have one for near misses. And those go out as emails to everybody in the organization. So, you know, two or three times a day, uh, I'll get uh, an, an email with photos uh, explaining what happened. That keeps safety top of mind for everybody. Yeah. What, what other techniques are you aware of? Uh, because, you know, you can't just do a safety campaign at the beginning of the year, for example, uh, and expect everybody to stay that focused on it uh, throughout the rest of the year. It has to be a day-by-day -day thing. Well, I, I wonder, uh, Shell, if you mean by the near Mitch, what we have heard in some organizations called a good catch, yeah. so that you've anticipated or recognized that there may be a safety issue. Perhaps um, 
you know, over the course of the day, the weather changed and instead of rain, we now have sleet. So advising people to be careful when they're going in and out of the building where the salt may not have reduced uh, the ice. Um, so to me, tracking those are, are really significant because people realize that you're being aware and you're being observant and that you can act to prevent something uh, more serious from occurring. And um, that puts the, the responsibility in the hands of everybody as well, if you have a system like that. Um, and again, when, when leaders take those reports seriously, when those lessons are shared more broadly, you know you're contributing to something as an individual. Um, and, and so I, th I think that's really important. Um, other things that, that I've seen happen in, in organisations I've worked in is, is to have safety performance as a as a key performance indicator from a, a from an organizational standpoint um, and and a, an organization's safety performance then becomes something that you report out on um, as something that um, in your in your overall governance really sort of matters um, and tied to that safety performance it can be financial reward um, and, and other performance metrics as well at the individual level to, to really drive home that accountability and and um, and leadership. I think one of the things that makes a difference in getting individual employees to pay attention to safety is you've got to deal with not just the knowledge of what to try to avoid or how to do it, but also the attitudes behind it. So the knowledge we can transmit in writing, with which we do very well, uh, even videos showing them how things work. But until you have people being influenced on their attitudes by people whose opinions they value, nothing's really gonna change. So let me give you a couple of quick examples and then a little bit more of an involvement. Quick example, there was an advertising campaign when I was younger that I remember seeing uh, to try to get teenagers not to be on drugs. And the commercial started with, just because everyone else is doing it, blah, blah, blah. Okay, what part of that did the teenagers hear? Everyone else is doing it, and I'm not. So that, they hit the attitude unintentionally was the wrong attitude. Um, another example is I have a client in manufacturing where they noticed that uh, from the security cameras, when the supervisors left the floor, the guys would take their safety helmets off. And no, no amount of knowledge training could get them to put them back on. So they delved a little deeper into the attitudes for why they took it off. They thought it wasn't very cool. So what, you know, what they did is they addressed the coolness factor. They created a program where every time something good happened or they got a training certification or anything, and a sticker was involved. There was only one place you could put the sticker on your helmet. So for those, those of you not in the United States where American football is so big, that's what college football players do. If they sack the quarterback or they get a touchdown, they put stickers on their helmets. So all of a sudden the helmets became cool. But the, the serious example that I, I wanna share with you is when I was back in the corporate world and we had a, a security company and we were having vehicle accidents like crazy, but different kinds of vehicle accidents. So the salespeople were driving their personal cars having accidents, our installers and service personnel were in these trucks that were having different kinds of accidents. And then our security officers that would respond to an activation were having a different kind of accident. You know, They'd be racing like police officers when they're not. So what our communicator there did is she figured out all these different stakeholders that were having different types of vehicle accidents. And to prove that what she was gonna do was gonna work was we did a pilot study. So we had seven locations and in three of these locations, during the course of the year, she was facilitating employee discussions about accidents that they had had, what led to them, how can you avoid it? And the people who were in the accidents were really compelling to the other people for how to avoid having the same thing happen again. Did it work? Uh, yeah, because in the three places they did this pilot, accidents went down so much that our vehicle insurance premium went down a million dollars for the next wow. year, which the CEO, of course, paid attention to. All of a sudden, communication mattered to him. Um, and we were able to calculate a return on investment for that that was enormous. So sometimes by doing a pilot, like you know that there's the right thing to do with safety, but people say, oh, that'll take too much time, people off the job, won't be productive. Do a pilot, do a small pilot. And when you can show that it makes a difference, that really becomes compelling and lets you expand it to everyone. But attitude is the key thing. You've got to address the attitudes as well as the knowledge of how to be safe. I agree. I, we, I was also involved in a, in a campaign where we used people who had been in accidents and, uh, and, and, talked, and they talked about how that had affected 
their lives. And one of those was uh, one of our very senior executives who'd come up through the ranks and who was missing the tip of one of his fingers because of an accident. One of the challenges with safety is that, you know, with, with all this great communication and emphasis, uh, employees will be more inclined to look out for themselves. Um, less so if the culture isn't right to look out for their colleagues. Uh, there is in the construction industry, and Alice, I, I also worked in the energy industry at one time, so I know this is true there as well, especially on the offshore rigs. Uh, a very macho attitude, right, among mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. these guys, uh, and yeah, it's the fact that somebody else is doing something that's unsafe. It's not macho to say, "Hey, dude, that's going to cause you an injury," right? So people don't. We uh, at Webcor uh, speak up for safety is is the mantra. The banners are all over. We're constantly reminding people that they should say something. Um, what do you do to get people to change their behaviors and put that macho attitude aside so that they will say something when they see something? I think well, part of it is rewarding the right behavior. <clears throat> I, I think that, you know, one of the things that I, I've done in certain places is find role models um, who exhibit that behavior and make them heroes in some way, tell their stories and share them widely. And, then when people are in that situation, hopefully they think of that uh, role model and they behave likewise. And you also share that information technique with people. Um, as part of one of the contracts I worked on, I was required like any other uh, regular employee because they so strongly believe that anyone who were had some kind of contact with the company should follow their safety goal and their safety values. And so I attended a session and everyone was required to participate. And we had scenarios and we practiced uh, starting with, you know, simple, fairly straightforward uh, situations to more complex so that we could become at ease um, with drawing and paying attention to those issues and also taking action. So that is something was unsafe and could not be changed, but only through a stop work, we knew how to escalate that and we got practice in it. Um, it's not always easy to challenge a colleague. Uh, there, there different dynamics can affect how you may perceive that information to be received. But if you can practice and show people how to engage in those challenging conversations or perhaps become comfortable with saying, I think what you did there was unsafe. Let's talk about how we can avoid that in the future. If you can practice something, you become more comfortable with it. And if you see that other people are practicing and learning, then that also helps with maintaining and contributing to that safety culture. I think that's a really good point. I think there's, there's also something to be said for the impact of, of not getting safety right. You know, in, in many cases, organizations can simply cease to operate. Um, you know, they'll lose they'll lose clients. They won't be able to qualify for for contracts based on um, negative performance. So, you know, I think that there's something in sort of talking about the organisational impact as well, and, and making that case clear. Uh, one of the stories that I really uh, enjoyed reading about uh, was out of Shell Oil, uh, where on an offshore oil rig, the accident rate was high. Uh, what they ended up doing was uh, hiring uh, this team. This is the activity that this team engaged in, outside consultant psychologists. Uh, and they took the people who worked on that rig uh, to an offsite uh, and basically got them to open up about themselves, personal stuff. Um, what kept them awake at night? What were their family issues? Uh, so these burly macho guys who worked on the offshore rig were suddenly exposing their vulnerabilities. And what it meant was, I know you better. Uh, therefore, I care more about you. And it did have the desired effect of uh, dramatically reducing the accident rate because wow. people did start to speak up because now I know you and care about you. Uh, what other kinds of approaches might we as communicators take 
uh, to get people to care enough about each other to want to uh, speak up when they see something that endangers a colleague. And, and by the way, you can find that story on uh, uh, NPR. That's It was, I think, uh, a show they do called Invisibilia that um, presented that story. I'll, I'll talk about one example. Um, actually, it was ERM's Safety Day campaign. We do a global safety day every year. Um, and we, so two safety days ago, we, we, um, we did a, 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 vi a video campaign that actually featured real employees. Um, and we got employees out in, in various settings, whether that's in the office, whether it was out in the field, whether it was with families, um, and we just showed ERM as in different settings in different ways, but that core message was was the same about wanting to go home safely at the end of the day. Um, and I think it sort of speaks to the, um, the the approach that you described there, Shell, in just helping people see their colleagues as human versus employees or, or numbers on a sheet. We, we have a question. Uh, I'll put it up on the screen from Howard Greenstein. Uh, in the pandemic, employees and customers have different levels of safety awareness, tolerance, and even patience. What are the best ways to communicate safety without adding to uh, people's fear? I don't know. Fear can be a helpful thing in changing behavior. <laughs> it's a heck of a motivator, isn't it? <laughs> I, you know, I think there's a listening piece here, you know, if because I, I, I sense um, as part of this question, there's, there's a level of empathy um, coming across and, and getting that into the, the communication approach. So for me, it would be really understanding where that fear might be coming from and then seeking to, um, to sort of address that as, as part of you how you communicate out. You know, um, I, I think with COVID-19, it depends on where you are in the world, doesn't it? And, and at what state your your government is intervening in, in life and, and how you can plug into that as part of the safety comes around it. I think that is a really critical point because frustration or impatience or a lack of tolerance, anger, underneath that there's fear. And so what is it that people are afraid of? And if you can give people a measure of control over their environment that can help calm the fear. Because one of the biggest things I saw in the early days of the pandemic was that we had no control. We had to stay in lockdown or we had to limit our shopping to uh, once a week or once every 10 days or people would um, order out for groceries, et cetera. So being able to give people a measure of control and that's one of the things that I have found really um, creative about how people have responded to public health education around COVID-19 um, is that a combination of strategies will help you. And so this will give you some measure of control. You can wash your hands thoroughly. You can uh, keep your distance. Lots of people had, this is two moose or two Holsteins or five sheep is to give people a sense of how to measure distance. Uh, one of the best images I saw just came across my newsfeed last week and it said that um, one technique is like a piece of Swiss cheese. But if you have three techniques used in combination, then you manage to cover up all the holes and you're more effective Aww. with a combination. So being creative with the message um, can help diffuse some of that fear and give control back to people who have felt powerless um, around so many issues arising from the pandemic. The Swiss cheese image is one that's used very frequently in the oil and gas industry to show the various uh, layers of uh, protection against various yeah. types of incidents. And so I saw that image as well, and it's a, it's a really good uh, approach. I think the other thing is, um, I think, uh, Martha, you mentioned about the the different ways of communicating distance, like two sheep or six sheep or whatever. Um, I think that having a sense of bringing a sense of humor into this helps allay fear a little bit. Um, if you can uh, use an, an image that people will laugh at, they will also remember it. And it brings the information with less of a, a sense of fear. Absolutely. Memorability, I think, is a key issue. I was just reflecting this morning, 
what was the first health message that I ever learned and have retained uh, for so many years? And if I just say the word apple, does it come to your minds as well? When apple I was a growing, day. Keeps the doctor away. It was the first health message that I ever learned. So being able to come up with something that is a reminder. When we developed a scent awareness campaign in the early days to create awareness that there were people with sensitivity to perfumes or uh, other uh, uh, body washes, etc., that were scented, um, I created a campaign and we called it Dress Sense and it was spelled S-C-E-N-T-S. -E and the image I used was a person in scuba gear to say, you know, we shouldn't have to dress like this person uh, in order to be able to work effectively in our workplace. You know, be aware that sense can harm people. Uh, and uh, another one was sense and sensibility uh, to get people to think about the issue in a different way that would uh, remind them that not everyone, uh, that we all have to share the same airspace. So I think that you will see some, um, I think there have been some really clever memes around mask wearing uh, that have also uh, applied some gentle humor that acts as a reminder to people um, about the practical things we can do to stay safe in this particular time. I, just to build on a couple of things that Neil and Martha have just said, when, when you were asking about how do we get people to care more about each other for safety, sometimes that's actually the problem. Uh, either they care too much, they don't want to offend them. But there was one example I had at a hospital where we were trying to figure out why the nurses were still having so many back uh, accidents because they were moving patients like from a gurney to the bed by themselves or you know, from one place to another, when they knew and they were trained to always bring another colleague in to do it together. And until we did the listening that, the, like Neil was talking about, to figure out, well, why weren't they doing it? They said, you know, my colleagues are so busy right now. They're with another patient who might really need them. I don't want to tear them away from what they're doing right now. So they care too much about the other person and they put themselves at risk. So we really have to do that listening to figure out what those dynamics are. And that's a key component around the work that I've been reading about and listening to my colleagues who work in violence prevention um, in terms of uh, trauma and stress that you need to also remember as the airline safety guide says, put your own oxygen mask on first mm -hmm. before helping others. And so realizing that you have to make that time to assess the situation and, and give people the tools and skills to make that decision. Because you're not going to be of any help to anyone in the future if you don't take that moment to ask your colleague to help you with that patient. Yeah. And that is a refocusing and a reorienting that sometimes is challenging, I think, especially for women in caring professions because you're trying to manage all kinds of things. But I also think we have to remind people that asking for help is a sign of strength. It's not a sign of weakness. And so that the people who are stronger together are the ones who look out for each other, who are aware of what's happening in the environment. So paying attention to signs you know, remembering to drink lots of water if you know the temperature is going to go up a certain uh, level or taking time to, you know, get enough sleep before you hit the road to do whatever it is that you need to do. So I think that concept of putting your own mask on first, which seems to resonate more, I think, in pandemic times as well, is something that is really important for people to know that you don't have to do it by yourself. And in fact, if you do it by yourself, you can cause yourself harm um, and perhaps others because you didn't take that moment. So that's how that hospital actually dealt with that situation is they built on that concept. They said, look, if you injure yourself, you're not helping your colleagues. They're going to have to cover for you. They're gonna to have to do more patients mm -hmm. during the rest of that shift while you're you know, in the ER. And so it was, it was taking what they were worried about or cared about and taking it that one step further. Yeah. I want to remind everybody that you can ask questions like Howard did uh, by using the chat feature in YouTube or sending a tweet with the hashtag COF62 uh, uh, and uh, we'll get those questions to the panel uh, for their input. Uh, one of the challenges that I have uh, communicating in a construction company is that I can reach the salaried employees 
without any problem. Uh, they have email. Uh, they have access to the intranet. Uh, they have, uh, they're in the spaces where the digital signage is. And uh, there's plenty of safety material going out through those, those channels. The laborers, the carpenters and, and the like, who uh, are uh, in, in our company, we're a union shop, so they're all union employees. Uh, they don't have email addresses. They don't get into the spaces where the digital signage is. They don't have access to the internet. Uh, that's a challenge. Uh, how do you reach the frontline worker who is not uh, privy to your communication channels? I think that's the biggest challenge for anybody working with safety communication. And uh, it's, you know, it, it comes back to two things. I think one is personal, interpersonal communication. I know a lot of uh, energy companies, they have what they call a, a tower meeting uh, that starts every shift. And you, you talked about having a safety moment. Well, the tower meeting covers everything about that shift and making safety the priority in that uh, meeting every day is essential. And the other is going back to old fashioned types of communication, whether that's a, a flyer that you hand somebody as they're leaving the workplace or um, a sign that you, that a banner, like you mentioned at the, at the uh, construction site or, uh, you know, any other kinds of uh, like old time non-digital communications that you can get out there. Uh, remembering that these people are a priority and making them feel like they're a priority because the, 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 other half of this whole not accessing the email and the digital act, uh, material and the building uh, is that they, they feel like they're second, secondary uh, and lesser than. And making them feel as essential as they are is really the point. I think in one way you can do that is for different types of information, people prefer to get that information through different sources. So one way to do that is when you're doing a communication survey is find out, including the topic of safety or working safely, how people want to get that information. So I had one client where I've got the sheet in front of me, so I've got the numbers, um, where we were asking people how they wanted to learn about staying safe on the job. And there was a huge difference between the exempt and non-exempt people, although there was also a commonality. So the non-exempts, the people who were actually lifting boxes, driving trucks, things, things like that, um, they could choose two of their most preferred sources of information for each topic. 82% said face-to-face, -face, meaning their supervisor, and then 46% said print. So reinforcing exactly what you were saying. So we need to use that right combination. Now for the exempt people, the people in the office, they were kind of split almost half and half between face-to-face -face and print. But so what you do when you learn something like this is if they want to learn about safety from their supervisor, you need to really prepare those supervisors to do the right thing. So this particular client had safety packs that included everything from information to share to activities that employees could participate in that their supervisors would tell them about. Um, and then they had speaking points for daily huddles, just like, again, you were talking about in the oil industry. So they would have a daily huddle and they gave them different things about safety, whether there was a recent accident and what to be more careful about. So you learn about how they do want to get it, what they do have access to, and then use that. And if it involves their supervisors, get those supervisors really prepped and prepared to, to be able to do a good job with that. Yeah. I think that supervisor preparation is essential. The, uh, one company I was with, we had uh, what they called safety leadership training. And um, everybody who supervised people on a rig or um, anywhere was eligible to take this. And they tried to get everybody through it over like a, a three year period and then keep, keep refreshing it. And the training was not just about understanding safety, but also about understanding how to lead people in a way that inspired them to uh, follow what you were advising. And I think putting those two pieces together is how you build a safety culture. And and I think, the, oh, sorry, sorry, go Shell? ahead, Martha. No, go ahead. Uh, one of my first conferences that I attended with the world, uh, the closing speech, and I, I'm forgetting his last name. So um, his name is Connie. And Eckert. he talked- Connie Eckert? 
Connie Eckert. And I have to say, it was worth the price of attending the conference to listen to him speak. And he gave an example from one of his early days. He was consulting with a company. They wanted efficiency. And so he developed this whole process of where to reduce the amount of time in the morning when drivers would get their assignments, they would go to this big board and get the uh, clipboard that had their assignments and so on. And there was, a, a, you know, one of the supervisors was, was very reluctant. And initially it was thought that this guy was reluctant because it was modern, you know, they were going to move to digital or to other forms of communication. And so he finally went up to Connie and he said, I have to tell you, he said, your system is going to kill someone. And Connie sort of looked at him and thought, well, you know, the clipboards are secure to the wall and <laughs> people can just, you know. And he said, no, you don't understand. He said, when I give out assignments, I talk to the driver. I can tell if he is fit for work. Is he impaired? Is he had enough sleep? Can I check and see? He said, I won't have that information if I just stick assignments up on the board. You're missing a critical piece of information there. So listening to the supervisors and that role, I mean, email is great, getting a printed flyer to support information that you read about in the email, but being able to have that face-to-face -face, um, conversation with people to share information and also to see how they're doing, I think is really critical. And too often we forget that. Um, and to me, it was such a useful lesson, a reminder that, uh, you know, again, reinforcing what we learned in health promotion, you just can't give someone a brochure and assume that it's all good. And, and I'll just add to that. I mean, I was going to make the, the, <clears throat> the exact same points that Angela made, but I, I know that Angela did a far more eloquent job than I would have done. So thank you, Angela. But but I'm, I'm sensing and, and <clears throat> throughout all of this is, a, is an overall point around humility and really not assuming that the message that you want to get across and the way that you want to get it across is the right one for whatever situation you're in, if that's a, an overall safety program update or a very specific incident related update. Um, and it takes a, a, a certain amount of wherewithal to, to really let yourself um, go with what feels right to the person that's on the receiving end. Uh, I want to stick with this idea of the supervisor for a minute. Uh, in the construction industry, everything is driven by schedule. Uh, we can talk about safety until we're blue in the face. Uh, but if the supervisor is more interested in meeting the schedule than in ensuring that people engage in safe behaviors, you're not going to hear uh, the supervisor talk about safety. This is a question of alignment. Uh, the the say-do gap, we talk about safety, but my boss told me to forget that and get this done because we have to stay on schedule. How do you bring supervisors on board in that kind of situation where they're being rewarded based on something other than safety? Well, the first thing we have to do is, is align the award <laughs> system, the, the reward system. I mean, what gets measured uh, gets, gets done. done. <laughs> and, and what time do you lose with a work stop order right. when somebody is killed on site or severely injured? Usually there's an occupational health and safety investigation. They may shut down the project uh, until it's established that they can return to work safely. So if you're in a rush, uh, you know, the other line is haste makes waste. So if you're going to skip out on safety as because you have a deadline to meet, uh, what's the cost of not being safe and having a project shut down and thus altering your schedule or perhaps yeah. causing some significant uh, delays. And, and that's the attitudes piece that Angela talked about, right? And, yeah. and you know, shifting shifting that, that those attitudes among that population that are so heavily influential. I want to talk about uh, another dimension of, of safety. Uh, we've talked about uh, people out on construction projects, uh, in the oil patch, in refineries, and and out on oil rigs uh, doing dangerous work. Uh, what about people in the office? Uh, 
you know, this is not where most safety messaging is focused. It's, you know, the, the, the electrical wire or, you know, the ladder and the need to wear your hard hat or your, your other PPE. Uh, you don't hear that much about safety for people who sit at a desk and tap away on keys all day. Um, but there are accidents in the office uh, and it is an issue. Uh, how do you get people in the office to, to pay attention to safety? I think research is a big piece of that uh, and knowing where those accidents happen. Um, and I uh, was recently working with a client and they wanted to increase their safety communication. And we were talking about, okay, how much of this is going to be directed at the plant and how much at the offices. And, and I said, let's look at where the accidents are happening and what's happening. And, and the two biggest uh, accident sor uh, sources were slips and falls, of which 40% were in office settings, and um, automobile things, uh, of which a large percent were also office settings. And so that gave us the topics and the audience to, 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 talk, to talk to and to use the, the terminology that they would recognize. That same client where I was talking about finding out their preferred ways of getting information, they had a campaign that was addressed two pronged for people who are actually, this is a company that uh, stores and uh, manages and shreds paper and boxes, things like that. So they had a lot of accidents that had to do with lifting boxes or the truck drivers not getting in and out of the vehicles the right way. But they also had, just as you said, in the office, it was, um, they had uh, tripping hazards. So the, some of the things for the office people were reporting damaged equipment because that could hurt you even in an office, removing tripping hazards when you see them, and then avoiding them if they can't be removed. So uh, they addressed all of these things over the course of the year. But the important thing about the way they did this is they wanted to be able to show that they actually made a difference. They didn't want to just do the right thing, see that the accidents go down and say, well, we took credit for that. You have to actually prove that chain of evidence that what you did actually made a difference. So in our survey, we also had a question that said, which of the following uh, behaviors have you paid more attention to this year because of this specific communication campaign? So now we're building a cause and effect. So it's really interesting that uh, they did have a, a hierarchy of certain types of behaviors they were paying more attention to than others. But when we ask the, um, the safety people, for their accident reporting year over year. We didn't just find out that, yeah, accidents went down year over year, great. But we asked them to rank order which types of accidents had the biggest percentage decreases in rank order. And that rank order of the accidents that got reduced was almost identical to the things employees said they were now paying more attention to. And that varied by exempt or non-exempt employees. But so you need to first do the research, figure out what the issues are, what kinds of accidents, what people, why are they having them, what knowledge and attitudes can you try to address through communication, through the right channels, and then prove at the end of it that it worked. Because then you can get more budget the next year to do more of the things that are working. And there are small things that happen. And it's always amazing to me that until it's drawn to your attention, you don't think about it, but how many people walk and fiddle with their phone, <laughs> right? And so they walk into people, right? How you can many go on YouTube and, and see videos of people having exactly. accidents because they're walking, yeah. looking at their phones. When I worked uh, with the nursing home board here, we were not allowed to walk around with an open mug in our mm -hmm. hand. Um, even if someone brought in from you know the cafeteria and they carried a tray, uh, anything that had liquid in it was covered uh, because something can slop out of your cup and then that creates a slip hazard. And as uh, Alice said, I, I think the stats consistently, at least from what I've been reading, slips and falls are quite common. The other area for injury uh, are hand injuries, like paying attention to your keyboard, looking at how you're opening things um, and using the right tools for the job that you have. And we tend to think of office environments as, you know, relatively safe spaces. And, and yes, perhaps compared to a rig, they are. But that doesn't mean that injuries don't happen in those environments. Um, if you have a poorly secured bookshelf, 
Um, if you open your file drawer and just leave the top drawer open, you can cause that file drawer, whole filing cabinet to fall over. So you need to also create that awareness and bring attention to those issues because it's not top of mind. And as Angela said, if you can tie the campaign and do your research and look at how behavior has changed and then what that result is for the company, then people start to see that, yes, paying attention to these safety messages, it's not an, oh, you know, here we go again kind of thing, but it's something that's practical and does have a positive impact in the workplace. And don't we all want to be feeling okay and able to do our work and not have to worry about, you know, dangers lurking, but if we take that moment to prevent because someone has drawn that to our attention, um, it'll all work out better for us. So I tend to really support safety campaigns that also address the inside workers as well as those that are outside because their safety needs are different. It's not that one group has a safety issue and the other group does not. And, and I'd say that COVID-19 has probably brought it front of mind to, yeah. to office-based teams yeah. in, in, a, in a very different way. Um, even even for us at ERM, who, who create that shared ownership, whether you're out in the field or at, at, in the at home office, and by home office I mean um, office building, um, you know we've we've seen a shift um, in in terms of the 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 way we look at safety of our people in a in a very different way, thanks to people staying at home, asking people to travel on public transport in, in these times. So it's, you know, it's, I think we're gonna see a bit of a shift in attitudes towards it. Uh, we have about eight minutes left and I want to pivot uh, to a discussion about a different type of safety uh, that's been getting more attention lately and that's psychological safety as opposed to physical safety. Uh, both psychological and physical safety, uh, if people feel that it is a safe work environment then they feel safe to contribute, uh, as our friend Mark Schumann would say, to bring their whole self mm -hmm. to work. Uh, how do we integrate psychological safety into the safety conversation? I'll lead on that one if that's, if that's okay, because you know sure. it, it kind of relates to the point that I was just making about COVID in, in that um, one of the side effects, I think, of COVID in the workplace is that it's elevated mental health as a as a topic of conversation in a way that I've never seen before. Um, and I and I think that speaks to the point around um, psychological well being. Um, so we're, we're, I think we're able to have that conversation a lot more openly than we were before. Um, but there's, I mean, there's a number of implications of psychological safety, but. Um, if, if people don't feel that they can bring their whole self to work, it means that they are distracted in some way. And I think that there is research out there that proves distracted employees from a whole self perspective can actually be more prone to have safety related incidents because their focus is not 100% on the job. So there is a, you know, there's a, there's a definite sort of link between um, whole self and, and safety performance. And, and there's, a, there's an inclusion related um, element to this as well, because if people don't feel safe and secure at work, they will not bring their full self and they will not be able to um, contribute as a whole person to, to, to their work. And that's, you know, if you think about the cost to productivity, to innovation, to creativity, it's, it's immense. So psychological safety is a, is a really big priority to, to address. And, and, and the barriers to psychological safety are things like harassment, um, not being included, uh, being marginalized. Uh, My, microaggression shows up there, Shell, as well. I think in this particular period, we are seeing more approaches, uh, conversations that people are having about if you're working from home how do you make space so that you can because before we have had a fairly clear demarcation you had work you had school maybe you had daycare you had your home so that those boundaries were more or less fixed now your home has become your workplace it's become the school it's become the daycare um, and so how do you you still keep some sense of uh, space or distance uh, between them. Um, 
recognizing the impact uh, when something happens. And I think for significant events in the workplace, perhaps if you had a safety accident that resulted in death, perhaps there was a colleague who died in a, you know, a, a very unpleasant manner or unexpected shock. Um, we we bring in people or trauma teams if there's been uh, a significant level attached to that. But I think even with everyday, everyday issues, just taking time to say to people, how are you? How are things going? Um, and making uh, your conversations that where you want to check in with people, that it, it truly is an interactive process. You're listening for the answer so that people feel and hear uh, that you are listening to them and are interested in what they have to say about how things are going um, and that you can be positive and supportive and identify and say, you know, well, maybe taking 10 minutes to go for a walk uh, so that, you know, you can clear that distraction and recognizing that impact, as Neil said, because if you do have distracted employees, their attention is not in the workplace. You're When you're not paying attention to something, that's when other things start to creep in and can claim your attention. I think also respecting when people are having a difficult time, that it's not just something that you can get over. You know, oh, watch a funny movie or, oh, have a, you know, a bowl of chocolate chip ice cream. That, you know, getting over anxiety or depression or fear uh, that's affecting your mental health and well-being um, is not just that easy. Um, and so that when people feel that just as, you know, a regular, uh, you know, what we would call an ordinary illness, perhaps, a, a, you know, an ulcer or something, um, that when we treat our uh, mental health issues with that level of care and concern, that people will feel comfortable being able to share and say, you know what, uh, I got some bad news on the weekend. I'm here at work. I'm doing the best I can. Just want to let you know that I'm not feeling 100% on top of what I'm doing so that then people can then look out for you and say, okay, you know, Martha's having a, a slightly bad day, not bad enough to stay home, but she's recognizing she's operating at 50% or 75% of her capacity. I think we need to make that part of the conversation that we need to respect when people can step back a bit and draw upon the support of their colleagues. Because if uh, we I, I'm sorry. No, no. Uh, I was going to say, this is where we as communicators need to um, partner with human resources and make sure that the managers and supervisors and leaders all have the training and the tools and the ability mm -hmm. to show that empathy and to know how to check in with people because we as communicators can't do it all. Right. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh because you know, not every organization has a full-blown training department. Uh, even those that do, uh, I think there's an opportunity for communicators to uh, get involved uh, so that the training uh, sends the appropriate message rather than uh, in addition to just implanting the, the rules of the road in the minds of people. Uh, we are at 58 minutes into our 60 minute discussion, uh, which leaves me enough time uh, to let everyone know what's coming up next month on Circle of Fellows. Episode number 63 will be on Thursday, November 19th, uh, same time, noon Eastern, although in 2021 we may try some different times. And I'll tell you why. Uh, Adrian Cropley was uh, going to be part of the panel uh, until he realized that it was at <laughs> noon Eastern, which for him in Australia is 4 a.m. Uh, and he said, no, no, no. <laughs> Uh, so I can tell you that the topic is new and emerging communication technology, something I have literally no interest in. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we have uh, Mary Hills, Brad Whitworth, and uh, Stacy Wilson uh, on board uh, for that episode and a replacement to be named later for uh, Adrian. So he does not have to get up at 3 a.m. Uh, to ready himself and participate. Uh, but looking forward to that, uh, this episode uh, will be available almost immediately as a video replay on YouTube and within a day or two uh, as an audio podcast. Uh, so if you have not subscribed to the Circle of Fellow podcast, uh, head over to FIR Podcast Network 
facebook.com and find Circle of Fellows and uh, subscribe. I want to thank everybody. I think it's been a, a, a great discussion. Could have gone on longer. I have uh, several questions we didn't get to, um, but I, I really appreciate your time. I just thank want to say so thank you to Anna Willie, who was very concerned about me bumping into the IBC logo. So thank you to Anna. <laughs> Yeah, I noticed that you you shifted a little bit. <laughs> I, I hope it wasn't hurting. <laughs> Safety first. Yeah, that's right. Safety first. That would be an accident, yes. <laughs> Yes, we should have talked about safety and Zoom calls and online. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you Thank all next time. Thank you. This month. was fun. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.